Tell Ralph we're, we're going to start ping without him. him. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to go ping him. What's that? Oh, he's right there. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, sure. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Unless you want to go to the lectern. <laughs> hey, everybody. At this point, I don't think I need to introduce myself. Uh, but I am going to introduce Mark Farley. Mark and I go way back at this point. Uh, Mark's had some very interesting projects going on at our Newport campus uh, for Oregon State University at the Hatfield Marine Science Center. If any of you guys are going over to the coast and you drive straight west, you will reach Newport and then you will hit the ocean. So turn left when you hit the ocean and then you will reach Hatfield Marine Science Center where you will see some of the wonderful things that Mark is doing uh, down there, including the augmented reality sandbox, which Mark is going to tell you about now. Great. Thanks for coming, you guys. How many of you have one of these or want one? Now, that's, that's an unfair question because everybody wants one. <laughs> so um, yeah, we're working on uh, one. It's not uh, wholly augmented reality yet, okay. but we did start a sandbox Great. and we have people Great. engaged. Well, hopefully I'll give you a little bit of a tour of our agony and success and see if you want to go there. Um, as I get to the last slide, we'll kind of really talk about what people are learning out of this thing and how they're using it and what we're doing with it. I've got a lot of nuts and bolts here, which I'm going to kind of plow through pretty fast because making stuff is something you're all familiar with. Um, part of this project is sitting underneath a big uh, NSF research project that we have going on in the visitor center at Hatfield, and it's called the Cyber Lab. And it's actually to take all that exhibit space and that family learning space and instrument it for observation. So we have cameras and mics everywhere so that essentially social scientists and learning scientists can use that as a laboratory for doing observations and research projects. Um, we started five years ago and had fixed cameras all over the place. We've gone to kind of mobile solutions now and like GoPros and kind of setting up stuff uh, a little more dynamically. Um, uh, we have a lot of systems that process the video and a lot of analytics that help us out in the research kind of design process. Um, this was our last research platform. So the sand table was kind of in the six year process was our last tool that we put in. And we were really asking questions around how people uh, interact with scientific visualizations. Sand table was perfect because it was all a tangible interface and that was really exciting. We've learned a lot about what people don't know about reading maps, what they don't know about reading uh, sea surface temperature visualizations, what they don't know about science on a sphere. So we were hoping that this would lead us to some insight uh, that kind of bust through some of those barriers. Um, so the Visitor Center at Hatfield, uh, we get 150,000 people a year. Uh, a lot of families, a lot of science-oriented folks. So we have an audience that's sort of set up to succeed there. So when we look at them, we really take anything that is short-falling pretty seriously because they don't really represent the general public very well. They, they uh, represent a focused public. <coughs> We're having a font failure here. Uh, be, um, so our lab, the observation network, we have surveillance cameras. We've got microphones that capture audio on kind of key spots, and we have a face recognition system in there. So I can track a lot of folks kind of at a meta level and then at very specific levels. Um, what that all represents is a whole lot of time and data for researchers, and that's pretty valuable for folks who really want to deep dive. Um, I've got a whole other talk on what worked and what didn't about that lab. So. Um, the video management system, we have 35 cameras around the center. Uh, four of them are pointed at the uh, augmented reality sand table. So we've been watching this thing for about three years and really looking at what works about the exhibit, what works about the hardware and software, and then what it, what it does as a learning object. Um, it's a package that is offered by UC Davis and it's essentially free software they have a lot of plans, a lot of blueprints, and a lot of what they call educator uh, support materials that are available on their website. 
they've done a really nice job of kind of handing you mostly a success. Um, it's, there's still a lot of technical aspects in there, but nice forum community too, a lot of users in the world that have this thing. Um, we, because we're a public institution, all of the prototypes that I was seeing from the UDC Davis site did not have an open general public touching it. It was always a facilitated tool. And so that kind of posed us some challenges because we're just, it's unattended, we just let people touch it. So uh, we have always learned that prototyping, no matter how much we think we know, is super critical in this operation. So we spent about three months prototyping this device. And uh, it involved kludge and stuff together from all over the facility, tripod, bicycle parts, old pieces of projector materials, um, aquaculture tanks that we drug out from out back to put the sand in. Because we also didn't know a lot about the height. Um, we couldn't have people or 10-year-old boys like doing high fives and smacking the projector. So how high can you get the thing up? How good does the image look? How far does the IR sensor have to be in or out of this thing? And can we just, will it survive the public? <laughs> um, we even prototyped the box so that we could really understand how high things needed to be. It's one of the biggest challenges around family-friendly exhibits is often the littlest ones don't get to play at all. And if the littlest, if we accommodate the littlest ones, the biggest ones don't get to play. So we did not know how tall this box needed to be. So we built a cheapo fake box. Lined it with foam because little people also like chew on it and cut themselves and all kinds of kind of crazy stuff. Um, the ceiling mount for the thing had to, uh, it was also unique because we have these tall ceilings. The thing had to be suspended down. Again, you can't like basketball hoop the thing and grab onto it and like, woohoo. So uh, we needed to make sure it could, number one, survive that if it did happen, but also be stable enough that we weren't getting out of register all the time. And I'll talk about that here in a sec. Um, one of the observations we made after we made this thing so robust, I mean, it really is this tank sitting above um, the sand table, is that a lot of older adults that have bad backs, they grab it and they kind of use it to steady themselves while they play with the sand table. It's almost like a uh, accommodation device. And every time I see that, I'm just like, oh my God, I hope the bolts up there are holding. But um, getting the projector in, the mount also had to, we had to have access to the thing. And because there's always something wrong with the technology. There's always something wrong with the cable. Um, somebody has thrown something, spit something, or dumped something. So having an open model like that was really important. Uh, giving people access to the buttons, uh, that's always a, uh, and uh, we, we have ongoing trouble with that presentation right there. Um, calibrating the thing. So with the UC Davis software package comes this series of YouTube videos made by a very German man, and he's super serious. And he goes on for about 35 minutes, very technical, really well done. But um, calibrating it was really challenging. And we really had reservations when we were calibrating in the back room, and this would take six hours to get something good. And we're thinking, oh boy, once the public touches this thing and they knock the table or bang the projector, are we gonna survive? Um, Prototyping, so prototype the thing, stick it out there before we spend a lot of money on it. Um, calibrating it was a series of um, measurements that you feed the software. How high is your projector? How far away is your connect? Triangulating the two beams, basically. They give you a, uh, they, the video shows you how to make this circle with X's in it and recommends you put it on a coat hanger. So the special calibration tools, you know, hanging from a hook in the back room. I get a lot of faculty coming and say, what is that? That looks very specific. It is. <laughs> um, so the system, just like your Wii and your Connect, sends out a whole series of uh, reference points. And you tell it yes, 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 and you get it calibrated. Just to kind of skip to the end of the calibration story, after we did this, and it took us you know, days of 
fussing with it. Um, we got it down to we could do it in about 10 minutes. Um, just being familiar with the system and the software and having the right tool and understanding what it's supposed to be even doing. Um, so, uh, and it's got fun error messages. Uh, <laughs> So you get this feedback in the middle of a two-hour process, and you're just like, "Go!" Oh. Um, one of the things about the uh, system that it accommodates is the depth of the sand is not specified. You can have a very deep sandbox. You can have a lot of sand, and that's something that we really want. When you see an accommodation for that in the software, you wonder what problem it was there to solve. We did figure out what problem it is there to solve, and that is the sand just disappears over about a week. And so your, your elevation is slowly changing in almost uh, real life ways. Um, we got the thing built. They recommended a certain brand of sand, which I didn't want to buy because it was like $8 a box and we needed like 30 boxes of them. And I was like, this is ridiculous. And nothing called Sandtastic is worth $8. <laughs> Um, so I got to, again, prototype my belief that I knew better. Um, regular sand, come to find out, doesn't reflect enough. It's not got the right stuff in it to bounce the light back. So you put in regular playground sand or beach sand, and it just kills the vibrancy of the output. Um, it also has a lot of uh, biologicals in it that grow once you add children to the mix. Um, so it starts to stink really bad. <laughs> so lesson learned on that front. Um, magnetic sand. Wow, wouldn't that be great? I can't believe the documentation didn't recommend that. In fact, they don't recommend it. I didn't believe them, and they, they were right. It's not good. It's creepy. And again, when you add children to the mix, something chemically happens, and it gets some um, gummy and starts sticking to everybody. It also uh, holds its form really specifically, so it doesn't create natural landforms where it, everything needs to be able to slide properly. Um, so that was a minor investment that uh, only. It doesn't flow. It doesn't flow right. So you, you create these landscapes that look like alien landscapes rather than natural landscapes. Um, the drain button. So there is a piece of hardware associated with it that is required, and that is the drain. So one of the parts of the software is you create all this lovely landscape. The topography is m mapped on it. You do an open hand gesture over it, and it rains. And that is so cool that everybody wants to do it all day long. So your entire landscape just becomes an ocean with underwater topography. And so everybody just kind of stands there and looks at the water, and they're like, now what? Well, you have to hit the drain button, which soft, it's a software trigger to drain the water out of the landscape. Um, we put in 20 of these to, to we found the right button that can stand a 10-year-old boy's attention 24-7. <laughs> um, in fact, when we found the right button, I bought like 10 more because I figured we'd get six months out of them. And indeed, we changed this out often because while the instructions say press and hold, that's really <laughs> um, just punching it as hard as you can over and over and over again probably will get better results. And every I, I can barely go out and watch this thing. It's like, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. <laughs> so, um, signage support, this is something actually we spent a lot of time at Hatfield doing. Aside from all of kind of just the, the lab aspect of this, there is just this constant process of perfecting science communication. And you never get there. It's a journey. It's a journey. It's never about the destination. Um, so one of the outcomes for this, and some of these are based on some of the material that the, the UC Davis folks give you, but they weren't adequate, so we kept them going. How it works, the technology. Number one question I get when I stand out there and they identify me as a staff member is, can I make one of these in my living room? It's like, sure. I mean, with enough energy, sure. Anybody can make it in their living room, and it would be super cool. Um, so it talks about what the technology, how it works, where it's from, and then how to download it, basically. Um, 
how do you make it rain? That is not an explicit part of the tangible experience. I mean, you walk up, you got a sandbox, no instructions. You do stuff and immediately happens. The open-handed gesture that has to be slightly out of the highest elevation range is tough for people to get. And kids want to just, you know, they're not really paying attention. At some point, if you interrupt the beam below the highest point of elevation, it maps your hand, which is really cool. And everybody kind of trips out on that for a while. Um, and they can't figure out how to make it rain. And finally, an adult will stick their hand up because they aren't. In oh, hey, it happened. So all the instructions in the world on that don't actually seem to make any difference. Nobody reads it. Make it drain, oh baby, yeah, a lot of pushing of that button. Um, and then one of the big outcomes that we're really having this thing there to answer is do you understand cartography? Do you understand map? Do you understand what's happening here? Like everybody's playing and have a great time, what's the learning outcome? Um, this is sign number seven in that iterative process of trying to find the right spot that engages people. The sand table is so engaging that really the signage is useless. Um, something that the software supports that we have up, and I have mixed feelings about it, is a wall mount monitor that basically shows the, what you're seeing in flat plane. Really, cool conceptual connect uh, for educational outcomes. So if you have trouble reading a map and you look at this landscape you created and you understand it, and then you look up at the monitor, you go, oh, uh, oh, I did that thing I don't tend to understand. This, when I work with school groups, um, big connection, but I'm not sure how, how deep it is. You know, they recognize they created a map. Anyway, this is some of the footage from our uh, system. Not got some adults watching. They're vaguely helping. The child is mostly being a front runner on it. I want you to notice these two pumps, and I'll talk about that. super uninteresting to super interesting. Um, so a couple nuts and bolts, little things we learned along the way. Uh, they walk in the museum. They come from a water area to the sand table area. And uh, oh boy, just all bad. Uh, wet hands. And um, we worked with this quite a while till we got people, till we found a win. Uh, providing them with paper towels, giving them directions, and we were, like I said, we worked on like multiple iterations of this sign, it just seems silly, but um, getting them to dry their hands, super critical. Again, we just get this bacteria bloom in the tank and it's bad. Um, so one thing we noticed initially, we made the box, uh, we thought we did a nice job of accommodating height for a, for a range of experience. Um, and then after a month or two, we noticed we had a lot of sand on the floor, like a lot. And as we watched a lot of the videos, the little guys that only come to about right, like their head comes to about right here, they reach up and they just start shoveling sand out. And we worked with a couple different solutions to that, just kind of toast, posting a volunteer, modeling correct behavior and all that good stuff. None of that worked. Um, I had a theory that if they could reach, they would behave better. And so we put this platform in behind it. And thankfully, we had a wall behind there because putting a platform in an open public space is just a trip hazard. So we had kind of an accidental win just because of the way the thing was placed. Once we got the little guys up, the behavior did change. They stopped flinging sand. Um, so that was a cool outcome that 
was an easy solve by putting just a little six inch deck in there. Um, when we went from the prototype to the final, our woodworker noticed that uh, we might benefit from an inner tip because sand gets piled up on the outside too. Because little guys that aren't engaged, right, they just start like doing strange things along the edge with the sand. So um, having it tip in just kept, you know, anything we can do to keep the sand in. Because like I said, it's like eight bucks a box and you need, you know, 16 boxes to fill this thing. So losing a box a week starts to add up after a year. Oh, yeah, and the sand, the places it will go. I felt like I was being part of a Dr. Seuss uh, story here. Um, if, it's, if you can conceive of a place for sand to go, it's possible. Um, we have sand, because of this, we have sand everywhere in the facility. And it's a certain color sand, so we know it's coming from there. Um, it's in computers, it's in mice, it's in our touch table. It, little bits of it were carried and carefully like stacked up on other exhibits. Um, it's in some of our model boats. It's everywhere. <laughs> and, you know, that's life at a museum, so we just deal with it. It's not a deal breaker. It's just one more thing for the staff to do. Um, so where we win, there's all these minor losers. Um, so what are they doing? And this is like we're down to the last two slides here. Um, what they're doing is really odd. Um, and I've watched thousands and thousands of people use this thing. And I'm always interested in the first five minutes of the interaction because they have no instructions. There may or may not be other people around. Um, what they all do is they immediately, they realize what it does. They've all seen it on YouTube. That's one thing we note is, Oh, I saw one of these on the internet. It's super cool. They immediately know that they get to touch it, which is really unusual because I usually have to encourage people to touch things. I don't ever have to encourage them to touch this. You know, our touch tanks, our animals, our it's okay to push this button, it's okay to crank this crank. You usually have to invite them pretty loudly to do that because a lot of people are like, oh, I'm not sure we're allowed to. This, they always engage immediately. And what they do is they scoop it up and they make a mountain. In fact, it's always Mount Doom, by the way. It's just always Mount Doom. That's like 90% of what we're doing is Mount Doom. Um, we scoop it up. And if there's other people there, they help scoop it up. And if there's other children, and there's even uh, cross groups, like family groups don't tend to mingle, they mingle to make the mountain. They make it, and they all go, wow, that's cool. And then they scoop out a crater at the top. And they make it rain, and they fill the crater up, and then they drain it down. And that's what they do, like <laughs> over and over and over and over again. And then what they do next, because that's interesting too, is, okay, now that we've learned how this thing works and we tested its limits, now what can we do that's creative? They make two mountains. <laughs> And they do it again, but with two mountains. And then the game starts to develop where can my drainage beat your drainage? And then what does it pool into? And can I make a butt out of that? You know, <laughs> can I make some sort of inappropriate shape for it to drain into? Now, usually parents are correcting that behavior. And they're trying to bring it back to the educational outcome. And it's like, well, let's try to make islands. Let's try to, you know, and so they start. But if they try to make islands, everybody spends like 10 minutes raining. Like everybody around the table, it's raining, it's raining, it's raining, it's raining, it's raining. Oh, it's getting closer, it's raining, it's raining, it's raining, oh, it's getting closer. One of the younger ones wants to mess it up. Um, so they make, you know, that much virtual water. And then they start making a mountain and bringing it up out of the water. And that's, that's, that's it. That's what we do. That's about 15 to 17 minutes, which is really high engagement time for an exhibit. Um, so I, I don't understand that at all. Like, and we, we've, we've got other researchers who don't understand it either and are putting some time and energy into some data collection and some interviews and all that. Um, what is really amazing about this is that you usually have to encourage enhance, support, collaboration between stranger groups. This 
absolutely invites it without any barriers. That is magical. Like, I, I can't buy that. I cannot buy joint collaboration. And so this thing just does it. Now, everybody who struggles with the exhibit wants to come in at the kind of map, you know, un trying to understand complex visualization. Because right? that's the big nut we're all trying to crack. How do we get the general public to read a heat map? How do we get them to read, you know, bathymetry? How do we get them to look at the scale? So that's sort of our science communication researchers. The ones who look at learning research and kind of family outcomes and learning roles in a family, they are just blown away almost to tears that this thing enhances and invites collaboration. So some interesting questions are being centered on that. Um, the tangible aspect of it, the fact that you are not being, uh, uh, there's no mediation between you and the, the action. So there's no device, there's no remote. I don't have to abstract anything to get what I want. I can just touch it and do it. Also, everybody takes to it intuitively. They love it. It really brings a lot of sort of joy and inspiration. They bring other people back to it. So we see the, the kids who run, come on and look at this. And they, they drag their family back. And that's kind of a specific role um, that encourages learning inside the family unit. Um, they bring back, and boy, they are in it immediately. Everybody's in it immediately. And that tangible aspect really does seem to be something magical about this. Um, it got us all thinking, OK, is there anything else like this? Like, is there anything else like this where you have that computer-generated visualization that marries something that you touch and manipulate on your own without any sort of technological interface? And we're all a little stumped. So this is breaking some really interesting ground. So what I think is kind of fun about this product is this was a byproduct of a watershed education process. The technology was not their goal. They developed it as like a collateral piece of information, uh, piece of uh, technology to support an educational objective. This was an accident. <laughs> and it's lovely. It's a lovely accident. And I love that story. Because we all make things kind of just to make our job work better that sometimes are often the better product. Um, OK, yeah, I think I just said this. But so yeah, non-expert users, they don't understand the visual language of topography, but they understand map and geology. They understand that water runs downhill. They understand a natural system, but they can't name. You know, So we've done some survey work on it. What's those lines? They're like, I don't know. Is that the computer telling me it's higher or lower? Yes, what's it called? I don't know. Do you recognize this in your other, you know, in real life? I think it's on some maps I have around backpacking. Did you understand that those lines, when they're closer together or further apart, represent elevation? They're like, oh, is that what that was? They collaborate without a plan. Okay, so psychic communication around an exhibit is really remarkable. People usually talk, and they're like, hey, you, it does this. Do this with me. There's none of that. They all just intuitively understand that this play that we're participating in is something that we all just understand. And that just blows me away. I think that's all of it. Um, so questions. I know you guys got questions about this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, any in fact that about is um, the next version. That is so the forums that deal with this piece of software get sort of change requests in, and the list is something we all love. So volcanoes, there is a volcano module that comes with this, so you can have it erupt. Now, basically, it takes water, the water module and the water representation, turns it into lava and slows it down. 
So it doesn't crust up, it doesn't make new landforms, so it just flows. It's cool. Um, the software allows you to change all the color representations. So we can do the bathymetric <coughs> representation, but um, the range isn't deep enough. So when you change the colors, you know, so white and dark blue, the scale gets a lot narrower when you start messing with the colors. So we've been able to kind of fake some bathymetry, but it's not satisfactory. Um, it will represent a tsunami wave, which has been phenomenal in some of our education around tsunami awareness. So if you have a water plane, the software recognizes landscape changes. So if you basically take a board or a flat piece of paper and you introduce it straight in under the water, and then you tip it up, the water knows that it's got to evacuate that space immediately. Software responds really fast, and it will create a wave, and it ripples, and it runs up onto the landscape and then runs back down. So we have little monopoly houses that we put up on the sand landforms. We challenge some of our more focused school groups to like, create Yaquinta Bay. Where are you staying in your hotel? Let's put your hotel right there. Okay, now let's make a tsunami wave. Oh, bummer. Um, <laughs> so, but it works, and it works beautifully. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> we, we support them a little more after that. But. Um, fires is a big request. Um, representing uh, different kinds of vegetation is a big request. So. They don't have any more funding. So they're out, they're done, their grant's all done. And like I said, this was a side benefit to their project. So user communities have taken it over and there's a couple small funded projects out there that are doing their own versions of them. One of the big demands too is a stream, like having a water source that is constant. And basically you define where your water source is in the software and then it just flows and then it flows out the other side so you can create dams. And so it takes the place of those stream tables that were so dreadful that had all the little microplastics in it, um, which everyone loves, but they're just a freaking mess. Um, so little fiducials is something everybody has requested too, like things that will trigger certain visual effects. Um, I will have to say that this runs hot like the processor that it takes to run this thing is the highest end computer you can ask for. Pretty high end graphics card. So the investment in the kind of computer resources is at about 4,000 bucks. And that run, that fan is running just zzz all the time up there. So I suspect we'll see a failure on that here pretty soon. But um, Unix, so it's all Unix based stuff. Um, that was thoughtful. Software updates come out like every couple months. Again, sort of supported by a user community. A um, lot of it is open source, so you can modify it yourself if you dig in. And uh, the documentation is phenomenal. So as far as invest, it, it is an investment. And it's an investment in um, logistics. A lot of logistics on this. But it is so You can use anything you want, yeah. but nobody uses it because it doesn't play well, you know. Um, you can wet it, you can introduce your own water, and it, it, it works. The water, it, it creates a flat plane. Because at some point we were curious, and we were like, I wonder what water looks like. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the wet sand actually holds, and you can make a lot of nice landforms out of it, but that's a highly facilitated space, because then you've got a bunch of like, <laughs> um, you mentioned you got 35 surveillance cameras, and is that in the whole center? And then you got yeah. four on the on sand pit one, itself. Yeah. So how do you deal with issues of consent and uh, Oh, yeah, privacy? yeah. So this is my number one question in my other talk I give. So we have an IRB that basically covers that entire public space. There is no expectation of privacy in a public space. We don't monitor bathrooms. We don't monitor. 
Uh, the research team is the only one allowed to really interact with that research footage, and, unless I'm giving a presentation. But um, uh, it was a really uh, ambitious IRB to go get. Um, I have to say, like, our IRB office here on campus gets kind of a bad rap for being slow. They were incredibly innovative about it and, like, super good partners. And the number one thing I get asked for all over the world when I talk about our lab is, can I have a copy of your IRB? Because <laughs> there's something, they think there's something magical about the protocol we wrote. It, it's really nuts and bolts stuff. It just was an office of somewhat younger professionals willing to think about privacy differently. And I really appreciated that because if we had an older, more traditional set in there, this project never would have happened. In fact, when we work with partner agencies and they want to put some of our cameras in theirs, the, no, we, the biggest hurdle to building partnerships with this is they just can't culturally or institutionally take the step to putting cameras in to do research. Now, it's like camera research has been done since the 70s. So this is not new, but something about that just bothers people. This is like the talking cube, is that what we got? Yeah, that's yeah, it. good. So uh, how does this, we saw this on the tour yesterday over in. Oh yeah, in uh, uh, COES. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so could you talk a little bit about how this translates into the classroom? Well, so they came over and looked at ours before they built theirs. Yeah. And they're like, tell us everything we're going to hate, do it with the, you know, is going to kill us. And so they've got, a, they've got a slightly different setup. It's facilitated, it's on wheels, it's got an arm, it's more mobile, and that's cool. Like being able to really take it around to classrooms is great. Um, for undergrad education, I think this is a phenomenal tool to help people visualize things that they struggle with. I mean, any sort of scientific abstraction, you, you gotta have them touch it. And this is magical for that. So it's sort of the gateway to understanding a lot of scientific visualization and abstraction of 3D environments into 2D. Um, even the color modeling, to just go through the process of changing a color model is a big aha for a lot of folks. Because there's something about the rainbow spectrum, and we've done a lot of research on this, and our findings are that don't use that. Like public audiences and sort of non-expert audiences can't read a rainbow spectrum because the median is yellow. And so yellow always visually reads as the hottest thing on the page. And so when you ask somebody, just you show them a climate change, sea surface temperature map, and you're like, where's the hottest thing in the ocean? They're like, the yellow part, because it's bright. It's like the sun. In fact, I've heard that dozens of times. It's like the sun. The sun is the hottest. It's like, OK, did you look at the scale? What's the scale? <laughs> I think this thing over here, can you take a look at that and then just take a minute, look at it, and then answer the question again. And they're like, yellow. <laughs> we worked with that science on a sphere, the globe. Have you guys seen that? It's, you know, super cool, very attractive. We wanted to know what is the actual value of it. So Noah paid us to figure that out. We were kind of a bummer because we kind of came back and told them their toy didn't work very well. But um, as an attractor and as a... Um, tool to let people know that think the earth is round, phenomenal. That down and up, oh, that's really interesting. Oh, that this sticks out more than that, super interesting. Oh, I didn't know that the ice took up so much of the planet, because when you see it flat, it looks really different. Like, excellent, 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 excellent. And then you get this question. So I've got sea surface temperature gradients on there. And uh, I get a lot of folks asking me, okay, so if you drive, I'm just out of curiosity. If I drive a boat out into the ocean, can you park it right where the color changes? Like, what do you mean? They're like, well, that light blue and that dark blue. Can you then look on this side of the boat and it's light and that side of the boat is dark? Like, no, no, this is an abstraction of temperature. <laughs> it's like, you get that, right? They're like, oh, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, sorry. Well, so can you see the color? <laughs> so, when we take that uh, rainbow spectrum and we turn it into hot, cold, blue, red, people get it. So that, that representation of color, color modeling 
has to match their life and how they experience things, because colors mean things. And so being able to change the color model on the topography makes some of those connections. And the guys over in the gaze lab are starting to discover that. It's, a cool, it's cool. And it's one of those just playing with it until you get to play with it with an audience that's live and kind of impromptu. You don't know. So I'm glad they have one. They don't lose as much sand as we do. <laughs> they also don't get as many Band-Aids in theirs. Um, <laughs> We have kind of, you know, we, have, we all have developed somewhat of a grotesque sense of humor, but um, <laughs> at the end of the day, we have a Band-Aid jar, and we have these little fish nets, and we, you know, fish Band-Aids out of tanks and plop them in the Band-Aid jar, and, and it's a bit of a competition at the end. It's like, how many Band-Aids do you have in here? <laughs> Suckers, sucker sticks, that's another good one. Um, so, any more questions? Now how many people want one? <laughs> yeah, there's the, that's the double mountain that comes after the single mountain. Um, uh, we've got some folks from um, Chicago Science, um, Museum of Science and Industry that have a couple of these. They can't wire theirs up. They can't do research on theirs. So they're using our site to do their research, which is a really great way to collaborate. Um, and so every couple weeks, I'll get a call from them and say, can you tune this? Can you change it? Change it, set conditions differently, set a condition differently. And so um, they've got a remote feed to the camera system, and they record stuff that's interesting to them and pull it off. So they're being able to kind of move their ball forward faster because we've got the ability to prototype with the public. And that our public, because they're essentially doing entrance by donation, they're also informed that they are a research uh, cult participant when they come in. So some of these exhibits may look funny. They may, uh, they're not broken, but there may be a piece of paper up here that's covering something that's part of the prototyping process. We make that kind of clear to our visitors. They enjoy being research subjects, and they feel like they have a voice in the process. And so I get a lot of feedback from people, especially when I ask. It's like, what did you enjoy about that? What was hard about it? What was interesting about it? Was it the right height? Did you like the way it smelled? I mean, um, I'll often put a whiteboard up next to it with a question on it. I get a full whiteboard of answers, and not all of them are inappropriate. <laughs> no. Yeah, it's interesting, and it's a uh, yeah. So it's our visitors, because they don't pay twenty bucks a head, are willing to put up with that process, and uh, so it's kind of exciting for us. Anything else, you guys? You're welcome. Thanks for coming.